year, there are one or two sessions which I'm introducing, which I'm really not qualified to introduce, <laughs> except from my respect and my enthusiasm, both for the subject and for the speaker. So I'm here today with Priyamvada Natarajan, also called Priya, and uh, she makes me proud to be an Indian and she makes me proud to be a woman, so let's clap for that. Uh, Priyamada is an astrophysicist who literally creates maps of invisible matter in the universe. So here's a brief introduction for those who don't know her work. Not so brief, actually, because she's done a lot of work. Um, Priyamada is a professor of the Department of Astronomy and Physics. She holds a professorship also at the Dark Center and the Neil Bose Institute in Copenhagen. Correct me if I, I get something wrong. She's an, also got an honorary professorship at the University of Delhi in India. She's interested in cosmology, gravitational lensing, and black hole physics. She works on the formation, fueling, and feedback from black holes and understood, uh, tries to understand their growth histories over cosmic time. How beautiful that sounds. <laughs> Her research involves mapping the detailed distribution of dark matter in the universe, exploiting the bending of light as it comes to us from distant galaxies. In particular, she is focused on making dark matter, dark matter maps of clusters of galaxies, which are the largest known repositories of dark matter. She's authored the wonderful book, Mapping the Heavens, Radical Scientific Ideas That Reveal the Cosmos, which will be for sale outside. Um, Priya has done her graduate work in theoretical astrophysics at the Institute of Astronomy and University of Cambridge in England. She was the first woman in astrophysics to be elected a fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge. She got a Radcliffe Fellowship in 2008 and 9, a Guggenheim Fellowship 2010 and 11, during which she was also a JILA. I don't know, what, what does that stand for? Yes, right here at the University of Colorado in Boulder. So she is one of us, if I'm one of you, which I hope I am and has been a visiting professor at the Institute for Theory and Computation at Harvard, where she is uh, currently an affiliate of the Black Hole Initiative. In January 2011, she was awarded an Indian Empire. Indian Empire? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, an India Empire NRI Award for achievement in the sciences in New Delhi, India. She's also the Caroline Herschel Distinguished Visitor at the Speaks Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, 2011-13, Chair of the Division of Astrophysics in the American Physical Society. Uh, she's interested in interdisciplinary engagement. I think that is a key to making uh, mysteries accessible to those who want to know them but may not have the vocabulary or the discipline to understand them but which are important to every human being. She is working on an exciting project in collaboration with the sculptor Sir Anthony Gormley on the haptic experience of space that involves journeying into space using VR and AR. She's deeply invested in the public dissemination of science. Her work is frequently featured in science documentaries around the world. She's a regular on NPR and a frequent contributor to the New York Review of Books. Besides, she's on the advisory board of Nova Science Now and uh, is enhanced, uh, she's engaged, no surprises, in developing strategies to enhance numerical and scientific literacy for the public at large. Now, let me tell you, this is uh, very impressive for five human beings put together. <laughs> but for one, because, and I say when one woman, I'm not getting, uh, I'm not mincing words when I say that uh, though women are prominent in science, it is not always so easy for women to um, establish or enhance their prominence in science. 
uh, as um, we had Angela Zaini explaining in her book. I'll move very quickly over to you, hand it over to you. We are all eager to listen in, but I have to tell you the last bit that it's not just about the wonders of the universe, but uh, the wonders of a particular community in South India, because um, this, I don't know, are there any South Indians here? Then well, somebody would know that there is a particular genius in some parts and some families, the Iyengar and the Ayer families, and all of us who grew up in India always had one girl who used to top in maths, and she was always from that part of the world. <laughs> so on that note, Pardon? Yes, I would like to do that, yeah. So thank you so much for that um, extremely long and generous, slightly embarrassing uh, introduction. And so, you know, this South Indian Tamil Brahmin thing, that's a stereotype, right? I mean, let's leave it at that. <laughs> no, no, not at all. No, but I think that, um, we, I mean, as a community, I think we're proud and with the way we see it is the emphasis on education and the emphasis that, um, you know, we used to be traditionally the sort of sac purveyors of sacred knowledge. That's what the Brahmins were. So I think I'd like to say that, you know, we've adapted very well to modernity and have started, you know, a uh, uh, lot of us have made careers in science and technology. Um, and I just wanted to say this is my debut at the Jaipur Literary Festival. So it's a real pleasure and a privilege to be here. And thank you, Namita, for inviting me and uh, having this opportunity to talk about uh, my work. Um, so I grew up in India, to just give you a brief idea of, because often, you know, you sort of read resumes and then sort of you see the person, and I thought I'd add a little bit of the personal dimension to it. Um, I was born and brought up in India. My parents are academics, retired academics now. And I was very fortunate that when I was young, I was very focused and I knew I wanted to do basic scientific research. I sort of come from a tradition of those families where this was a valued pursuit. And so interestingly, the time that I grew up in India, it was not um, peculiar for a young girl to be interested in sciences and to do well, because it was a time in India where the stereotype was the inverse of what it's here. If you were bright and you were smart, you did the hard stuff. And that's when you were cool. You didn't have to do things that were really easy or pretend to be dumber than you are. You know, things have changed now, sadly. Uh, things have changed. And so I was very fortunate also to have some fantastic mentors, um, you know, principally starting with my parents. I had a computer uh, for myself. Uh, this was in the 1980s when almost, you know, institutions didn't quite have computers in India. And I had my own personal computers. And those of you who are my age group, it was a Commodore 64, so that dates me immediately. And, and I, um, I had my first taste of research. Um, I grew up in Delhi, Nehru Planetarium. And there was this young woman at the time, Dr. Nirupma Raghavan, who um, was a PhD and took over the directorship. And I went to her and I said I wanted to do a project. And uh, she sort of fobbed me off saying, little kid, you know, I was 14 years old. And I said, well, I have a computer and I know how to program. I can do stuff for you. Is there, do you give me something to do, right? And she gave me a project. Um, and the first project that I did, she said, um, you know, the, the newspapers, they published a map of the sky once a month, telling you which planets you could see and if there were any lunar eclipses and so on. She said, why don't you program your computer to make this star map for New Delhi? And so I did that, and later she told me she never imagined I would come back. It was a hard problem. She thought, okay, good, I got rid of this pesty young thing. I showed up, six weeks later, it was summer holidays, so I worked nonstop. And this is when, I was always in love with maps. As a child, I used to carry, we had one of those old times atlases of the world, and we have a photograph in which I cannot lift it. It's very big, and it was very small. And I used to sit on the pages and try to see what was going on on each page. So I think the maps were an obsession. So when she gave me this project, it really clicked. And I said, oh, God, I've got to do this, right? I did this, and then I showed up. And this is how prescient she was. 
I showed up and she kind of didn't believe I had done it because it was hard, right? So I had a printout. This is before I, we had, there were laptops and I could show her, right? So I had a printout and I showed her the map. And she said, oh, this is really good, Priya, but what if you go to college, say, in Boston or something, or you live in Brisbane or something? Wouldn't you want to know what the night sky? I said, oh, don't worry about it. The way I've written the program, you can put the latitude and longitude of any place <laughs> on Earth. And, <laughs> and she told me many years later, that's the moment that she realized that, OK, I want this kid to work with me for as long as she's in school, right? I'm going to get stuff out of her. And so she got me hooked, and uh, I um, ended up being very fortunate. I got a scholarship to go to MIT uh, for my undergraduate, and that's how the journey began. So should I just go ahead and get started? So what, um, what I wanted to share with you today, um, so I wrote this book a couple of years ago, so I also had um, an interesting trajectory. I knew I wanted to do physics and mathematics, and I majored in physics and math. But I also majored in uh, philosophy, because I was very interested in the deeper questions about nature and about what science really is. What is science really doing in terms of understanding nature? And so after I finished my undergrad, of course, I was in an accelerated course. And I decided that um, I read Kuhn, and I was not satisfied. And I said, hmm, but you know, I want to be this person who not just does science, but also thinks about the doing of science. I wanted to be an insider and outsider to the scientific community. Thomas Kuhn was not a physicist, but he wrote about physicists. I wanted to be a physicist, and I wanted to have the humanities training to analyze it and to write about it. So I joined a PhD program in the humanities in, uh, uh, at MIT in the program Science, Technology, and Society, where I started a PhD in the history and philosophy of science. I abandoned that after three years, after learning to read and write as the MIT joke, those of you who know the MIT joke. Um, and, um, but, and then you know, I went to Cambridge to do my PhD, and then just career took off. I uh, was very fortunate with lots of great ideas, then ended up at Yale, where I still am. And I always had this itch, like I wanted to write this book. And, um, and the time wasn't right till about a few years ago, and I, um, wrote this book, and what motivated me to write the book, aside from my love of mapping, and I wanted to show how we cosmologists, even today, are basically no different from the explorers of the 14th, 15th century, people who are venturing out into the unknown, and for whom there's a real attraction for things that you can't quite reach, just a little bit, sort of the limits of knowledge, the limits of uh, exploration, the limits of technology. So in this book, I talk about a history of ideas of the last 100 years in cosmology where we've made tremendous progress. In 100, you know, 100 years ago, we did not know about the existence of other galaxies. We knew, we knew only about the Milky Way, which is our galaxy. We didn't know there were other galaxies, and now we've mapped billions of galaxies in the universe. And we've found all these black holes. We know how galaxies form. And then the universe was also unmoored. In 1929, Hubble discovered that the universe was expanding. It was not a static universe. And that was a very disorienting discovery. And most recently, in 1998, we found that not only is the universe expanding, but the expansion is accelerating. So we're really hurtling away from each other. Neighboring galaxies are hurtling away from each other. So there have been these tremendous discoveries, and I wanted to still show that even with the most radical ideas, scientists are human. So, you know, ambitions, hopes, fears, dreams, competition inform the acceptance of radical new ideas. So as scientists, we are trained to accept new ideas, to be really open-minded. That's part of our training, because we have to... Um, change our mind depending on what the latest data, the best data, and the new evidence on the basis of newly invented instruments tells you. And um, you have to re reformulate your theories and change your mind. But we're human, so we push back. So in the book, I talk about the human and the psychological side of science, which also fascinates me. But um, what I really want to talk about today is <clears throat> give you a sense of the history of one of the radical ideas that you know, I have just 
Okay, there's no other word. I'm in love with it, which is the idea of black holes. And I work on black holes um, actively um, in research. And so what I wanted to show, um, show you today, um, where is the clicker? I guess it's here. Okay, I can't quite see. Is this the, okay, that's the advancer. Yeah, I think I need a little bit of light on this because it's really shiny. Okay, great. I don't need this mic anymore, right? These mics work? Yeah. Do these work? Okay. They don't work? Yeah. This one's, they do. Okay. <laughs> so I think we may want to turn down the lights a little bit. It might help you. Can we turn them down a little bit more? Because um, there's some beautiful visuals that I would really like you to be able to see. So as I said, this is some of the um, motivations for the book that I wrote. <coughs> I have a terrible cough because the bragging is allergies. <coughs> Apologies. So um, as I mentioned, um, <coughs> when we look at the uh, at radical ideas um, in science and particularly in cosmology, there's a real kind of tortured process for acceptance, even though you would think after my telling you that you know, we are trained to be open-minded and nimble and so on and so forth. And there's a lot of resistance from within the scientific community. So I'm gonna give you a bit of a glimpse of all of that with the idea of a black hole, so when it was first proposed. And um, in the book I do many case studies, but before I do that, let me kind of uh, tell you a little bit more about um, what's fascinating about maps. So maps, not only do they lay the terrain and give you a sense of where you are, but they also have historically encoded our level of knowledge. So a map tells you what our conception of cosmos in the context of cosmology was at any time. So the oldest cons um, map, if you will, broadly uh, construed, is the Nebra Sky Disk. And so this was discovered, excavated in the Saxony-Anhalt region in Germany. And it has been dated to 2000, between 2000 to 1600 BC. We have no idea what these people were doing, why they made this map. It's basically a brass plate, and you see the sun, the moon, the crescent moon, and you see what we believe to be the star cluster Pleiades. Why, what the purpose of this was, what they used it for, we have no idea. And on the other, um, the graphic that I'm showing you is one of my favorite um, sort of civilizations because they were obsessed with mapping and that's the Mesopotamians. And this is just one clay tablet, a cuneiform tablet called the Venus tablet. And so, you know, cuneiform is now deciphered, so we know exactly what that is. So these are positions of the planet Venus that they tracked. Okay, first of all, you should gasp at this point because they already knew the difference between a star and a planet. Isn't that awesome? I mean, this is seventh century BC, right? And so they were inveterate charters of the night sky, right? Um, so we'll fast forward before you get really worried. Oh my God, she's starting with 7th century BC. When is she going to come to 2018? So I will quickly move forward and um, just give you a sort of a quick tour of some of my favorite maps. And in particular, these maps encode a major intellectual shift in time. So. This one is one of my favorites from about the 1300s. This is AD. And at this point, the Aristotelian Ptolemaic view of the cosmos was the accepted view. The fact that the Earth is at the center and that we are the most important, uh, most important uh, location in the solar system. So it was actually a geocentric view and the other planets and the sun revolved around us. Right? So this is a map, um, and remember, these were depictions, as I said, of our state of knowledge. And at this point, they still hadn't started thinking about causes and causality. Why is the cosmos the way it is? 
was not asked as a question as we understand it now, which is scientifically asked. So an explanation was not what they were looking for. They were looking to make correlations between what happened in the night skies and what happened on Earth. You know, floods in the Nile, thunderstorms, seasons, they were trying to correlate. Um, but a shift starts to happen, and the first glimpses of that shift appear in this map. And what you see here is four angels, sorry, two angels in the corners turning the crank and explaining night and day and the seasons. So this is sort of the first time that we get a sense that we're starting to look for an explanation for why the night sky changes the way it does and the motions of the planets. Of course, uh, this is a very nice movie that the California Academy of Sciences folks made for me to show. And this is the geocentric Ptolemaic view where you see the sun at the center and you see um, all the other planets moving around. Of course, you all know in 1543, Copernicus radically altered our cosmic view. He shifted the pivot from the Earth to the sun and he reordered the solar system. This was the major radical remapping of the solar system and of our cosmos. Our cosmic view went through a fundamental shift. And um, you know, can you imagine how tickled he would be if he would, um, were able to uh, look into the future and see that now we were able to send two probes, uh, man-made probes, the Voyagers 1 and 2, that actually left the solar system. He could never, ever have imagined. And I often say that to point out that, you know, the course of future science cannot be really predicted at all. In 1543, he never could have imagined that in the 1970s we would be able to send these probes out, right? So anyway, the cosmos got reordered. And um, we started looking for what we call scientific explanations. And now we have a really credible scientific evidence-based explanation for how the cosmos came to be. So we have a cosmic storyline that dates all the way back to when the universe came into being at a time that we call the Big Bang, that we define that as t equals zero, the beginning of time for our universe. And the universe was very dense and hot, and it expanded and started to cool rapidly. And over time, we have this timeline nailed down. We know the age of the universe uh, to three decimal places. We know it's 13.783 billion years. And we, knew how, we know how the first stars formed. We know when they formed. And we have a theory that can explain all the observed phenomena that we see in terms of galaxies, their spatial locations, their various types, the various kinds of galaxies, black holes. So we have a nice comprehensive picture. However, it's a pretty uncomfortable cosmos in terms of its composition. So we live, we appear to live in a bizarre universe where we understand a lot of this unfolding, but everything in the formation of structure that we see in the universe is driven by these unseen forces, predominantly unseen forces. So this is the cosmic inventory, right? So this is the account of everything there is in our universe. And the ordinary matter that we are made of, everything in the universe, including us, um, the stars and the galaxies, everything that we can see in the universe is a mere paltry 4% of the universe. Okay, so there's a lot more matter though, more than us. And so 23% of it or 90% of just the matter inventory is dark matter. And we know it's there, we have evidence for it. In fact, it's dark matter that shapes and drives all the formation of galaxies. That entire story that I showed you, the structure formation story, is driven. The driving seat, dark matter is in the driving seat. And what we know about dark matter is that it is matter, so it has gravity, but it does not emit any light in any wavelength, not x-rays, not infrared, not radio. So it's not visible at all. And we think it's made of some very peculiar particles that don't interact with anything. They're kind of lazy, they laze around. They're everywhere. 
they're ubiquitous. There is dark matter in this room, okay? But it doesn't interact with anything else. The reason we are able to spot things, right? We are able to find protons and neutrons that come out from the cosmos into the atmosphere is because they interact. They have charges, they interact, they produce little speckles of light, we're able to detect them. This stuff goes straight through us. It doesn't interact. It goes unimpeded. Thankfully, it doesn't break up our atoms as it goes through us, right? Because it doesn't interact with anything. But it forms the majority of the matter in the universe. We know it exists because of the light bending, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more, and the gravity, the effect of gravity that it exerts, because it, it um, shapes the motion of objects, it affects the motions of objects. So, and we have this other peculiar thing called dark energy, which I alluded to earlier, that our universe is not just expanding, but the expansion is accelerating. And you all know from driving that in order to, if you are pressing the gas pedal, it's the gas pedal, you're consuming gas. You're putting some energy in to accelerate your car. So the universe, we believe, is accelerating, driven by this peculiar thing called dark energy. We don't know what it is either. You might say, oh, this is great, but you know, she's talking, you know, do we really know anything about the universe? She says we know everything, but then she says we don't know anything. Well, we don't know the nature of these things. We don't know what they are, but we know what they do. Okay, as I'll show you. We know exactly what they do in the universe because we are seeing evidence for it. So um, what I wanted to show, because I am obsessed with these dark entities, because to me, the fact that they're slightly out of reach, and you know, and I, okay, I should confess, I also don't like the world the way it is. It's really messy, it's a uh, world. Uh, is um, full of inequality and unhappiness. And to me, the cosmos is my escape, right? So I don't care if these things are you know, um, missing at the moment. We'll find them. And uh, so one of the entities that I have been fascinated with, and a lot of you who probably have kids uh, will also know that you know, this is something that a child would immediately get fascinated with the idea of a black hole because they are such peculiar enigmatic objects. And so what I would like to now take you through a quick journey, this history of the idea of a black hole. And it's a very peculiar journey because the black hole started, um, was proposed as a mathematical idea. It was not expected to correspond to anything real in the universe, and you'll see why, because the properties are so bizarre. And their existence was debated for a very long time. They said, oh, this is cute mathematics, it can't be real. And it turns out not only are they real, but they're very important. Like our galaxy, the Milky Way, hosts a black hole in the center, which is four million times the mass of our sun. And that this black hole, over cosmic time, as our galaxy assembled over these billions of years, has played a very important role in shaping us, in making us a spiral galaxy, and so on. So we know that black holes are weird objects, not expected to exist. Not only do they exist, they are vital to shaping galaxies. That's our current understanding. So I'll take you through that journey. And so um, it was Einstein's theory of general relativity that proposed the idea of a black hole. So he came up with these field equations. And these are equations. Essentially, the idea is simple and yet profound, right? So Einstein realized the geometry of space and motions in space and the properties of space are intricately related, right? So our universe, the past, the present, and the future of our universe is intricately controlled and defined by the shape of space. The contents of the universe are what and the geometry, the precise geometry of the universe. So he postulated that we could think of the entire universe as a four-dimensional sheet. So think of the three-dimensional version of a sheet Right? And this sheet is the universe. There's nothing above it. So our universe, we are all embedded in this sheet. The tiny fly in the ointment is that it's a four-dimensional sheet and that one dimension is actually time. And it's three spatial dimensions, as we know, the usual spatial dimensions. So I think of this sheet, that's the universe. Nothing above it, nothing. Everything in the universe, including us, is sitting on this sheet, embedded on this sheet. And what he showed is any matter, so that space, space-time, as it's called, any matter in the universe would cause a little divot or a bump, a pothole in this sheet, okay? 
And therefore, wherever you have matter in the universe, you'll see a lot of little potholes. So it's a pockmarked universe. And where you have a lot of matter, you have a very deep pothole. I often joke, because near where I live in I-95, uh, it's the interstate, I think we take the cake for potholes, right? So I'm like, oh yeah, I know why I live here, right? So that I'm reminded always that I can't forget gender relativity. So one of the other things, because there's nothing in the universe above or below, and we live in this universe with these undulations, these potholes. Remember, light also lives in the universe. It gets transmitted through the universe, through space. And so light rays, when they reach us from distant objects, if you have potholes because of matter between us and the object, light will have to traverse through the pothole. And there's an effect, so light would get deflected into the pothole back up, into another pothole back up, and so on. And light rays carry information of every pothole they have encountered. So this phenomenon is called gravitational lensing. So you can imagine if you have matter that you can't see, so this is how dark matter was, you know, um, uh, proposed in the first place. But you, you, you know, any matter in the universe, whether you can see it or not, induces a pothole. And you can see if there's something there if the light gets bent through it, right? So that's one property. So this is the shape of space or a cartoon that shows you the impact that matter has on the sheet of space-time. So if there was no matter in our universe, then you just have flat space. Just the sheet would be just spread out, and that's a pretty boring universe. We wouldn't be here either, right? So when you have, say, the sun, what the sun does, it locally distorts, and you have this sort of pothole that you see. So around the sun, around every star in the universe, there's a little pothole that's generated. And the depth of that pothole depends on the mass of the star. So if you have a star that's 10 times more massive than the sun, it'll be a deeper pothole than what is shown here. Then you have these objects called neutron stars that are the end states of stars. These stars, neutron stars, are extremely compact and very, very dense. They're very densely packed. And notice they make a deeper pothole in space-time. A black hole, on the other hand, to give you a sense of how compact and dense a black hole is, it would make a puncture in space-time. Okay, so let me explain a little bit about, there are many, I know this is pretty non-intuitive about what do you mean by a puncture in space-time? You just told me there's nothing above below. Well, there's punctures. You can make punctures in space-time. It's a fabric. So there are a bunch of different ways to, so this is one way to think about a black hole. And this is for people who uh, have a sense of, you know, a geometry and a sense of um, sort of spatial understanding of spatial uh, distortions. So this would be the impact in this scheme. So you have space-time that is warped by the sun, for example. And what you see there is the orbit of Mercury. This is a cartoon. And so what it shows you is the orbit of Mercury, right, is closely skirting the pothole. So the impact of the pothole will be felt quite strongly by Mercury. So the orbit of Mercury is perturbed, is perturbed because it's skirting so close to the edge of the sun's pothole. Um, and in fact, one of the major proofs of Einstein's theory when he proposed it, he didn't intend to explain it, but it actually explained the precession of the perihelion of the orbit of the planet Mercury, and because it squirts so close. So um, the other way in which Einstein's theory was ratified, I mean, this is to tell you that you know um, Einstein's theory was ratified, and one of the solutions to his equations was the shape of space around a black hole. So it was a mathematical, so and a black hole is one of the densest, you can think of it as a dense, you know, very compact object, and it distorts shape extremely, that puncture, right? So the other test of Einstein's, we know that it is a valid solution because his theory was tested with the motion of Mercury's orbit, the precession. And the other thing that made Einstein like an overnight sensational star and ratified his theory was this bending of light. So you can see this bending of light when you have a solar eclipse. And basically you have the, um, the Earth and the sun line up. So now you know the sun lines up, so it makes a big pothole now, right there. And it will bend the light of stars that lie beyond the sun 
and we are receiving light from those stars. And so six months later, whatever, a few months later, when the sun has moved out of alignment, you can go back and you can measure to see where that pair of stars was, how far away from each other that pair really is. And what you find is as a result of the solar eclipse, they are actually shifted apart. So they're not, they don't appear um, the actual position and the apparent position, there's a difference, and that deviation is because of that pothole. So the origin of the idea of a black hole, right, um, which was a mathematical solution, no one thought it was going to be real. And, you know, it's only in the 1960s that people started discovering these end states of stars. They discovered neutron stars, and so one of the other byproducts, if you have a very massive star and it dies, it can either give you a neutron star or a black hole. So when they discovered the neutron star, they knew the cousin, the black hole, had to be there. And the discovery of quasars actually showed them. So when I started writing the book and I started looking into the history of the word black hole, I was very surprised to see it has an Indian connection. So it turns out that the first time the word, the phrase black hole was used was to describe an infamous prison in Calcutta where the um, East India Company soldiers had been captured by the local Nawab and they had died overnight. So it was a point of no return. So that was the popular use of the word. And it turns out that this object has this uh, black hole, as predicted by Einstein much later, had exactly those properties. So let's quickly think about another way to think about a black hole. So another way to think about a black hole is this notion of escape velocity, escaping the gravity of something. So if you look at the Earth, we are you know, launching um, satellites. You know, Musk just launched uh, SpaceX. So you have these satellites that have to be, the escape speed from Earth, they, have, they need rocket boosters because they need to escape Earth's gravity. And the speed that you need is about 12 kilometers per second. It's quite a lot. We have to burn lots of rocket fuel to get that out. Imagine now if the launch speed of getting something out of the gravitational effect of a black hole is the speed of light. Okay, the speed of light is the cosmic speed limit. There's nothing that can... Uh, go faster than the speed of light. So what is peculiar about a black hole? The escape velocity from a black hole is the speed of light. That means not even light can escape a black hole. So you have this puncture in space, and the black hole has the sacred boundary. It's called the event horizon. So anything, including light or us, unfortunate person who falls into the black hole, will just not escape. And then there's this other region, these orbits around, where you would be eternally trapped, like you know, Dante's limbo, right? So you could be actually trapped eternally. So these are the peculiar properties. So the nature of light, time also changes around a black hole. Time slows down around a black hole. So now let me show you how black holes are really real. So these are Hubble Space Telescope images of a real galaxy. And a black hole is harbored right in the center of a galaxy. Now, of course, this is an artist's rendition because we can't actually time lapse and follow a galaxy all the way to the center. But this is what a black hole is. Around the black hole, you have a lot of gas that's swirling around that you see in yellow and red. And because gas is being sped up and attracted by the gravity of the black hole, it gets heated up and it starts glowing. So the way we see black holes is from the dying gasps of the gas that is going to get gobbled by it. And that's how we detect black holes. And the faster the gas is swirling, the hotter it is, the bigger the black hole. The more, the stronger, the umphier the gravity of the black hole. So this is how we know um, uh, where black, hole, black holes are, they are in the centers of galaxies. We see them everywhere in the cosmos, but we see them in one of two modes. As I said, you can see matter falling into a black hole. Those black holes are feeding, they're uh, feasting on gas, and they power these objects that we call quasars. And then there are, uh, there are black holes like the one in the center of our Milky Way, which is really a fussy eater, which is really taking in piddly amounts of gas, partly because there's not much gas left. Most of the gas in our galaxy has been converted into stars a long time ago. So this black hole is actually fasting. So you find black holes that are either feeding or fasting. And I wanted to show you this beautiful movie. Let me see if I can play it. Mm-hmm, that's too bad. 
Okay, so this is, the, uh, this is the distribution of black holes in the inner part of our galaxy. So, the, I mean, these are tiny black holes. We have a supermassive black hole that is four million times the mass of the sun in the center, and you have a lot of piddly black holes all around. And this is detected from the X-ray. And this is a side view of how gas feeds into a black hole. The black hole is right there in the center. So we also know that, as I said in the beginning, that black holes really shape the galaxies that are, they are sitting in. And so we see these correlations between the mass of the black hole in the center and the mass of stars in the inner region. And this has given us a clue to how important black holes might be in shaping galaxies. In the universe, galaxies grow by smashing into each other. So these are two galaxies, a simulation from one of my graduate students' PhD work. These are two spiral galaxies that have a black hole that's flickering. You can see it's feasting, they are growing. And these black holes are going to merge when the galaxies merge and they're going to end up shaping the final galaxy that forms after this very violent encounter with another galaxy. And this is how we believe that the brightest galaxies, the biggest galaxies on our universe form by this kind of cannibalism. So, um, this is an old movie, this is um, zooming right in, so you have a big black hole sitting in the center, a second one has plopped on, and you're getting a top view of how it scours its way inside and ends up. The two black holes end up merging. And why is that interesting? That's very, very interesting because, for some reason, okay, the movie, I think, is starting to play now. You can see the second guy starting to zoom in and making its way to the center. The, um, in the center, you have the bigger black hole. This guy is going to merge. And what you see in yellow is the disk being eaten away by the second black hole. And so what is exciting about uh, the final merger of two black holes is that when they do, they actually shake up space. And they produce waves in space that are called gravitational waves. And we just detected the first gravitational waves from stellar mass black holes. So black holes that are about 10 times the mass of the sun, 30 times the mass of the sun by the LIGO collaboration. And the, what I work on are these supermassive black holes. Their collision we know happens, but it's yet to be detected because the frequency uh, with, at which you could detect them uh, is tiny, so we need these detectors in space. So I'm actually involved in um, a European Space Agency mission. I'm on the NASA science team for the satellite called the LISA satellite, which is basically going to be up in space, and it's going to detect these tremors in space-time that are going to come from supermassive black holes smashing into each other. And so that's um, something that, you know, so this is the LIGO experiment on Earth, so we need the space equivalent of this to actually find supermassive black holes that are colliding. So this is just a uh, LIGO to show, you might remember having seen this in the news. And you know, 2017 Nobel Prize went to uh, two physicists from, three physicists from the LIGO collaboration. So these are all the known tiny black holes. And so the supermassive black holes, these are the supermassive black holes. If you look at the y-axis, uh, the vertical, you see the mass of the black hole. It's a billion times the mass of the sun. So these are black holes that are sitting in the centers of the brightest galaxies nearby. So we know they're there. This is the census from quasars, the ones that are um, feasting. And so this is LISA. This is the space mission that's proposed by the Europeans, where, which will detect these tremors in space-time, the fabric of space-time that are uh, produced by gravitational waves from merging black holes. So um, I will just uh, stop here and tell you that you know, I really hope this mission is expected to fly in the late 2020s, tw early 2030s. And you know, I would be really excited if in my lifetime that window could be open. So I'll just stop so that we have time for questions with this movie from NASA. I'm hoping we can play it. Uh, which contains um, a lot of computations uh, from my research group and others of what we currently understand. This is the state of what we understand about black holes. And the accretion disk is just the feeding gas disk from which the black hole feeds, where it heats up the gas and feeds. So what you see here is a simulation, a supercomputer simulation that took six months on one of the biggest supercomputers. This is mapping the flows of gas onto the black hole. The pink and the blue tell you about gas that's flowing inwards and outwards. So these are the two colors that shows you what's flowing in and what's coming out. And you can see the nice swirly pattern. 
and uh, of around the black hole. And you see that edge. You see the inner edge of the black hole, that edge. So that's the event horizon, and you see an edge outside. So that's an edge that we are hoping to detect for the black hole of our own galaxy uh, in the near future. And that project is called the Event Horizon Telescope. And so, you know, uh, watch for new results from them next April. They should be announced in March or April. So the goal is to see if that shape, so that shape has been predicted for the, um, the edge. And that's a test of Einstein's theory, because remember this, the entire you know, entity black hole and its properties were predicted by general relativity. So you just see here, um, this is just showing you, you know, how much energy is in the gas, how hot the gas is, and therefore what kind of x-rays you would actually detect. And in the little cartoon there, you see how a satellite like the Chandra satellite, um, what is the vantage point from which you're looking at the black hole. And so you see, as I said, you know, the matter is sped up incredibly fast. And so right around the black hole, you could be moving the gas at, you know, half the speed of light or something pretty close to the speed of light. And, you know, there are all these, the physical processes that happen. We understand them extremely well. We can explain why and how hot the gas is and how it evolves over time. And so this is sort of, you know, to give you a feel for where we are at at the moment. I think it should stop after this. Anyway, I will just, just stop it now. Okay, so I just wanted, for those of you who are interested, um, I wrote a piece on what uh, questions about the first black hole. So I'm right now very interested in how the first black holes form. The first black holes I showed you could form from the end state of the first star. So you could make a little seed from that. Uh, but my, me and one of my other collaborators, we have an alternate idea for how you could make the first seed black holes. They're called direct collapse black holes. Um, the evidence in support of them, I have to say, um, is uh, mounting. And we have um, a telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, that should either validate or invalidate my theory. So we'll see how it goes. And if you're interested, I wrote um, a piece that was actually the cover of Scientific American in February earlier this year. Um, talking about what the frontier is in black hole astrophysics. So thank you so much for your attention. Lots of questions. So you said dark matter doesn't uh, interact with us, although of course it does interact gravitationally. Mm -hmm. Is there any chance that there's enough inhomogeneity of the black of the dark matter near us that it would affect um, our observations of you know planets and things like that? Do you know how dense um, it is locally? Right, and, right. And you how know, much does it vary? That's a great question. Actually, it is um, smeared very lightly close to us, sadly. So it doesn't actually impact um, either the dynamics of the solar system. We don't have to worry about any dark matter co needing to correct the orbits because of dark matter. Yeah, so it's smeared very, very lightly um, near us. It's kind of a curse and a blessing, right, in a way. So. Oh, thank you for your talk. It was fascinating. I was wondering, Most welcome. wondering what uh, books you would recommend for a lay reader about. Um, Which aspect? Well, you know, do you want uh, me to state the obvious by my book? <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think that goes without saying then. But, uh, particularly about uh, Einstein's theories and about how they relate to black holes. Yeah, so um, I think there the, are the really a, a ton of books um, that have talked about. So I think the books that I like um, are, there's one by Kip Thorne, who won the Nobel Prize. Um, I love his book. And he wrote another book. You know, he was one of the producers of Interstellar. And he wrote a book about the physics of, inter, of making Interstellar the movie or something. I forget the exact title. But there's a book that he wrote on black holes called The Black Hole Paradigm. And then he wrote one that's slightly more technical. But, you know, it's, um, 
It's really fun. It's very well written, so you could skip the stuff that uh, was getting hairy. But the book about uh, making of Interstellar, he uses that as an excuse to actually explain black holes and why they visualized it the way they did. So I really recommend that book. Priya, two quick questions. Yep. Rather pedestrian. Mm. Is there any sign of life outside Ooh. our galaxy, in our <laughs> galaxy, or a galaxy, or outside our galaxy? And there's been a good deal of discussion about UFOs mm. uh, in recent years. Is there anything to it? Yeah. Hi, Bud. So I know Bud. So. <laughs> okay. Um, life. Um, so, you know, at the moment, we found about 5,000 planets, but they're all very much around stars, right around the neighborhood. So very much in our galaxy, really local backyard. So what is very clear is that there probably are more planets than stars in the universe because there are multiples around many stars. Well, you know, ours has multiples, so we found many multiples. So we know that in terms of probabilities, in terms of sites, we have a tremendous number of sites where you could have potential for life. So then we start getting into the debates of what constitutes life, bacterium, virus. I mean, does it have to be familiar to us, right, to our notion of life? And uh, then, of course, there's intelligent life. So there are many, many kind of leaps. Do I believe? What do I believe? Uh, do I believe there's life elsewhere? Absolutely, there has to be. But I don't think it will necessarily needs to be in a form that we will recognize as life. You know, Stephen Jay Gould famously said that even on the Earth, if we turn back the tape of evolution and ran it back up again, we may not end up with human beings the way we are because there's so much randomness that's introduced in evolution at every step that, you know, it's really uh, quite possible that we wouldn't be the end product. So I'm open and I'm very excited at the prospect and, and I think that, you know, one thing that most biologists and chemists and biochemists can now agree on is that most likely water is a prerequisite for any kind of complex life. And hence the obsession with finding water, as you might see. We're all constantly saying, oh, could there have been ancient water? Could there be current water? And so on. As for UFOs, um, they don't exist. I don't think that we have no evidence whatsoever for any objects that were not created by humans that we have encountered um, sort of, you know, technical, mechanical kinds of objects. Sorry, can you pass this down to the... Thank you. Yes, I'm very curious. Ever since I read Stephen Hawking's um, A Brief History of Time, he talked about the singularity that yeah. formed our universe, mm -hmm. and he actually postulated at one point that the boundary conditions that were necessary for the ex coming into existence of the universe were that there was nothing. And I would really like to hear your comment on that. Right, so um, uh, this is a great question. Um, uh, the question is about the origin of the universe, the fact that um, we believe that this universe itself started out as a singularity, but that we required very specific sets of conditions, initial conditions, to give the universe, give birth to the kind of universe uh, that we have. And often the common interpretation of nothing is the, um, is the literal interpretation of nothing. Scientifically, vacuum is not nothing. Vacuum is actually, empty space is actually quite rich. You, you have particles and antiparticles that are being born and are you know um, dying, they're being created, they're being destroyed, all the time. So vacuum is a very happening place and it's not nothingness. So I think there have been claims um, where some physicists wrote book, oh, the universe from nothing. No, it's actually not nothing. Um, vacuum is not nothing. And, um, and I think um, Stephen wrote, um, in his later years, he wrote a whole bunch of essays and articles where he talked more from, so you know, NPR, we did uh, this summer's reading was Brief History of Time, and I was one of the people leading um, the book club through that. Um, and I mentioned there, and on their website, there are many of the interesting pieces that he wrote at later times in post um, Brief History of Time, where he talked about uh, our growing understanding of the singularity and of the initial conditions of the universe. 
But it's a tough question, huh? This, this is a pretty tough question. I haven't completely answered it. Physicists don't completely know the answer yet. But, you know, we're on it. Yeah. <laughs> My question's pretty similar. I mean, what was there before? Nobody knows. And then 13 billion years is not a long time. So, mm -hmm. you know, in this sphere of endlessness and forever, I mean, that's what, this little thing just blipped out and all of a sudden we exist and then... Right. You know, what, what, it, was, it doesn't make sense to me. But what doesn't make sense? Well, that... I can't see you actually. Oh, Where? back here. Ah, there, okay. Just that there's... That we are here doesn't make sense. No, or? that it, mm. I can't. Well, I mean, I can't I, wrap my brain around it. But right. I mean, no, I think you know. I I don't know if you are trying. I'm, I'm going to assume that you're trying to push me towards this concept that we have, which I believe in, and the operative word is belief. Um, is this idea of a multiverse that you could have many, many other universes out there that have different histories, different compositions, different properties, maybe even different laws. You know, the laws of physics may not be the same. There could be other universes out there. I'm totally game with that. Because I think it's very hard to explain why our universe has the very particular laws that it has and why did it have the fate that it has and so on. So I think you can call it kind of, you know, a bit of an escapist route. But I, I think that, you know, statistically it's quite possible there's like an infinite number of universes, right? So which means if there's an infinity of them, then there could be another universe in which Namita works in black holes and I am the accomplished writer like her, right? Writing fiction. I'll go for that. <laughs> There, there's a young person there, young gentleman. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, could you raise your hand? Sorry, can you? I think you can shout if you don't mind. Oh, yeah. Make yourself heard. Yeah. Um, mm. so, oh, this is loud. <laughs> <laughs> so I have two questions. The first sure. one. You talked about your second theory about the creation of black holes. And I'm Seed black where holes. I find yeah. um, more on that. So where, the Scientific American article. Okay. So I talk so about it. They're called direct collapse black holes. Of course, you could go to the guru, Google, and Google direct collapse black holes. And you'd find all the scientific articles as well as you know, the observational evidence that's been adding on for the last decade or so. Uh, it's super exciting. And my other question. Mm -hmm. um, what is kind of your idea about why the um, microwave background radiation is irregular and is not completely smooth? And I'm curious, I know that's kind of also an unanswerable question, but what would be your idea about that? Yeah, so we actually understand quite well. So this is a great question. He's asking about um, the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is basically a relic, early relic, the heat relic of the early universe, which was very hot and dense as it was cooling. So this, we have a picture, we have data, we have light that has traveled to us from when the universe was about 400,000 years old after the Big Bang. And that light has been traveling to us. So as I mentioned, the speed of light is fast, but it's not infinite. So as this light has been reaching us, the universe has been forming galaxies, forming stars. So the light, the photons, you can think of them either as particles or as waves, the light is encountering these forming galaxies and so on. So it's imprinted on that light. You have these little inhomogeneities that it encounters along its path to us. So all the seeds of the structure, the fluctuations in the dark matter that eventually, give, remember I told you dark matter is in the driving seed, it forms galaxies. We have initially start out with a hot universe and you have a sea of dark matter. And the sea of dark matter has some gentle waves in it. These waves grow over time because of gravity. It's like having a sand pile and then the pile gets bigger and bigger because you know the matter here attracts more stuff from around, it gets bigger and bigger. And then that region will form a galaxy. So the microwave background, which is the relic radiation from the early universe will encounter, has encountered galaxies as it reaches us. So it produces little inhomogeneities. So if you remember the second graphic or so that I showed, when I showed you the picture of the universe from it was 400,000 years ago, it has it's mostly green and blue, it has little yellow and red spots. So we actually understand extremely well. In fact, it's a test 
of whether our formation theories for galaxies is correct. And so that is one of the major proofs uh, of this dark matter driven theory being correct. And we have measured those fluctuations at the level of one part in a million. So really tiny. We've made some of the most accurate measurements of that. Thank you. Most welcome. So, I'd be happy to hang around outside and answer any more questions. So, so you can continue the conversations outside. Thank you for Thank sharing you so the much. mystery. Thanks, everyone, for coming.